Let's stand together for the reading of God's word and find First Chronicles chapter 16 and verse 12. <coughs> First Chronicles 16 and verse number 12. A time to act. This uh, day is dedicated to the m memory of 9-11. And I'm sure like me, many of you have w participated through uh, video or whatever uh, in the various activities that have been going on uh, where they're showing the films of what happened there in the two towers and all that kind of stuff. How many of you have got into some of that? Okay, I always do that too. It's good to remember, isn't it? It's important to remember. <clears throat> we must never forget. However, we also need to understand the importance of acting on what it is that we, remem that we remember. The lessons learned and then how to act on those lessons learned. The Bible says in 1 Chronicles 16 verse 12, Remember his marvelous works that he hath done, his wonders and the judgments of his mouth. Let's remember not only the great things God has done, Let's also remember the things that he has said to us in his word, his judgments. Father, help me now to preach with clarity the message you've given for us tonight, or today, excuse me, and tonight. I pray, Father, that you will give me wisdom how to uh, present that message that you have so wonderfully burdened my heart with. It's interesting how you do that, Lord, how when I get along with you and we talk about what it is that you want to say to your flock, how you begin working to shape in my heart that message you have for us. Uh, I feel that keenly coming into this message this morning and the follow-up to this message tonight. So help me, Lord, faithfully to deliver the burden of your heart through my heart to every heart that's here. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Thank you. you may be seated. And amen. Well, it's a little warm this morning, but not as bad as it has been. Wow. Thank God. I think I can leave my jacket on today. All right. <clears throat> it is a day for remembering. <clears throat> I mentioned on my radio show that I would uh, set aside this time to talk about how we should act on what we remember. And I want to do that with you this morning. I began um, this post, my post 9-11 experience began in Santa Clara at the North Valley Baptist Church. I was there for a preacher's conference of some kind, that or a music school thing. I have been there for both of those, and I don't remember which one this was. I think it was a preacher's conference, <clears throat> but in any event, <clears throat> excuse me a moment, <clears throat> I was there with Evangelist Paul Abbott. Now, Evangelist Paul Abbott's going to be with us uh, beginning next Wednesday. He'll be with us Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Are we having service this Saturday? We're not having a service Saturday, and then he'll be with us that Sunday. And uh, then we're going to send him on his way on Monday. But he's going to be with us Wednesday through Sunday, and I'm looking forward to having him with us. I always do. I love Brother Abbott. He was a, uh, uh, one of my students at the Baptist Christian schools where I was the principal. So I have a lot of things I can tell you about evangelist Paul Abbott. But I'll save him for when he's here so I can embarrass him a little bit. But anyway, I'm just kidding around. But he's, uh, uh, I tell you what, I've watched him grow into a man of God. And he's a great and powerful preacher, and I'm looking forward to having him with us. <clears throat> he's a real champion of uh, the abolitionist movement against abortion. And he'll probably be talking to us somewhat about that as well. <clears throat> I really appreciate what Mike and Alicia are, are doing to help us get this launched, to get this started. Um. So anyway, I praise the Lord for praise the Lord for you. I thank God for that session we had Saturday. It was a good number showed up. Only a few who had signed up were not able to come, but almost everyone was there. And uh, praise the Lord, we got a good strong group that showed up to learn about this. And then now this coming Saturday, I know some who came yesterday will not be able to be here next Saturday. They already told us that coming in. But uh, if you want to come, you're welcome to come, even if you didn't sign up. You can do what you call audit the class. You'll have to sit in the back, though. You don't get privileged seating. I'm just kidding around. <clears throat> but I'm looking forward to the next session. Amen. When we'll learn some more about getting us prepared to go out there to our Planned Parenthood in this community <clears throat> and, and make our statement and try to save some lives. Amen. 
and maybe turn some hearts of those workers there away from that dirty and terrible and horrible business. More about that later on. <clears throat> but I began my <clears throat> post-9-11 life <clears throat> there in Santa Clara. <clears throat> I sent uh, evangelist Paul Abbott on ahead and said, I'll be there a little bit later. I want to stay back and spend some time praying and uh, with the Lord. Just felt like I needed to. So he went on. <clears throat> I stayed behind. While I was shaving, I kept thinking to turn the TV on. Now, I, I, I never turn the TV on in a situation like that. I don't like to, uh, especially if I haven't finished my devotions and I was just sort of praying and doing the warm up for my devotions is what I was really is where I was at spiritually <laughs> with regard to all that. So normally I would not turn the TV on until after I had spent some time in prayer and uh, in the word of God in prayer and all that kind of stuff <clears throat> in the morning <clears throat> and then <clears throat> try to get some news and see what's going on and go about my day. <clears throat> but I kept thinking to turn TV on. <clears throat> <clears throat> <clears throat> I'm sorry. So I thought, well, that's weird. Is that the Lord or is it just, why, why do I want to do that? And so I kept, then he kept bugging me. So I thought, well, okay. So I went over and turned it on and I positioned it so I could look at it in the mirror while I finished shaving. I think a lot of good that'll do. You can't hear anything. But I, I didn't even get that far in this because as soon as I turned it on and began to turn it to do that, I, I, I noticed what was going on. And I was watching the aftermath of the first hit, the first plane. <clears throat> and I immediately thought, we're being attacked. <clears throat> that this, this, uh, you know, this is not some airplane pilot that lost his way and you know, decided to run into a building. That, that we're, this is some kind of an attack. So I'm watching this, and as I watch and thought about that, I'm listening, trying to get an idea of what's going on. The next plane came, comes in, and I and I watch that happen, and then I, I said, oh, yeah, there's no way. This is definitely attack." And I, I fell on my knees and I began to pray, and ask God to help us and deliver us. I knew that we were under attack, and uh, you know, at that time with the lead up of things going into that, I figured it was from uh, from some Islamic radical group. <clears throat> I figured it was a terrorist attack and began to pray. Now, where were you on 9-11? You probably remember it. You probably remember very vividly where you were and how that impacted you. And here's the thing for me this year. <clears throat> Every year thereafter, obviously, uh, the first couple of years, it was more poignant. The memories, you're closer to it, Right. And then, but as the years go on, you begin to kind of get a little farther from it and a little distance from those feelings you had that day. The horror, uh, the darkness that came over us, the fear, and uh, the uh, a very keen acknowledgement, we need God right now. We need God real bad. And uh, so, but as you get away from that, of course, if you're a Christian, you hopefully you, you maintain that anyway, even without a memory about 9-11. But as you get farther away from it, the 9-11 thing begins to fade a little bit. Um, you don't, it's not the kind of thing you forget. It's like JFK's assassination. You just, it's not the kind of thing you'll ever forget, right? How many of you remember exactly where you were when, JFK, when the announcement that JFK was assassinated? I mean, exactly, all of us. <clears throat> there, so there are these epochal events that happen in our lives and our history that just become kind of memorial stones in our heart if you will, and you'd never really forget them. But the JFK thing doesn't affect me today the way it did then. And the 9-11 thing didn't continue to affect me with the level of impact that it did the day it occurred continually down through these years until this year. Until this year. And I'll tell you why. I'm feeling some very familiar things right now for my country. I'm feeling today very, very near to what I felt that day. Because so much of what's going on in America today is like what went on then. And I want to explore the ways in which these things are similar. This BLM, Antifa, supposed peaceful protest. They don't even bother with that. They say mostly peaceful with a fire, with a burning building behind them. It's mostly peaceful. 
It's just, it's outrageous. You can imagine what you would think if on 9-11-2001, uh, <clears throat> with the burning buildings behind them, some stupid reporter was saying, well, it was mostly a peaceful attack. But it's very, very similar. <clears throat> they hate America. Those who attacked us on 9-11-2001 hate America. Those who are attacking us today in 2020, they hate America. They hate Christianity. Those who attacked us in 2001 hate Christianity. And those who are attacking us today, they hate Christianity. Surely you've seen the videos of these BLM, Antifa groups, and I put them together. I realize that uh, there's supposed to be this distinction between them, but no, they've become the same thing. Um, I'm kind of weary of this constantly saying, yeah, but, you know, the BLM, it's really a good movement. There's just some bad people in it. Have you been paying attention? That isn't true. The BLM movement is a bad movement. The sentiment that Black Lives Matter is certainly something that would resonate in anybody's heart. But now, have you noticed these slick commercials they're bringing out? Trying to counter the All Lives Matter response? Have you noticed it? I've seen two or three of them. It's really pretty disgusting. You pay attention, you'll probably notice that they're saying all lives can't matter until black lives matter. That is so wicked. Friend, all lives matter means black lives matter. But you've heard their hate-filled rants. You've seen them set up Bibles on fire and then warm their hands on the fire of that Bible. How many of you have seen that video? Then they put a flag over it position it just right and set it on fire they burn the bible with the flag it's very interesting to me that they understand the connection so you've heard their hate filled rants you remember hearing the I, I, I could do it better than that but I just can't get it going today whatever it is death to America right well, these crowds are doing the same thing. They have a different, they don't go, they don't dribble their tongue and all that kind of stuff, but they're doing the same thing with their fist pumps in the air and they're, they're, they're doing exactly the same. They're the same people, same spirit, same thing. Death to America. Remember that? Death to all infidels. They hate Christians. Death to capitalism. Death to the Constitution. Death to the Bill of Rights. It's exactly the same thing. It's the same. Only now, we're watching our cities burn instead of the Twin Towers. And we're listening to chants that say, no justice, no peace. As they behave unjustly. Something else is the same. It's the same game. These people hide their greed and their envy and their hatred behind an ideology. They claim that killing all Americans is about avenging injustice perpetrated upon them by a certain religious group colonization right you've heard that over and over and over again America uh, is is colonizing well we should talk to Japan about that maybe we could talk to Germany about that maybe we should talk to France about that we didn't colonize any of those countries we could have. We could have certainly colonized Japan. But we didn't. 
Are there some people that think that way in American government? Yeah, and they're all Democrats. That's exactly right. They're all Obama appointees in the Pentagon and in the military. They do think that way. And some Republicans too, by the way. Did you know that there are devils among the Republicans? It's a shock, isn't it? The devil joins every party. There are even some devils that have joined the independent party. Anybody here have a party? That ha have I named, have I missed anybody's party? Would you raise your hand and tell me what it is so I can tell you that the devils are there too? They accuse America of colonizing and that supposedly justifies their hatred of America and, and the fact that America is supposed to be destroyed. They hate all of America for what a really a very small handful of Americans ever did. Decades and even centuries ago. And that is not characteristic of the country. But incidental, isolated incidences that occurred here and there in history. Not something that's an ongoing main activity of the country. The same thing is happening with Black Lives Matter and Antifa. They're hating an entire group for what some in the group did decades ago, even centuries ago. Same exact thing. You see, the, you see the similarities. These thieves, they do the same thing. They do it in order to thieve, to steal. They use it as a cloak to hide behind so they can justify taking and stealing. That's what it's about. I was reading in Ezekiel how God was complaining against the Arab nations because they were stealing God's land. They were appropriating the land of Israel to be their own. And God expressed his anger and displeasure at that. They see the wealth and the riches and the prosperity of the of the, of the land of Israel under Jewish uh, leadership there and everything. And they want it. They want it. They just want to take it. They're just petty thieves. Some of you who follow the Brahmas show remember a, a show or two or back, I talked about the fact that this is not, don't give this the dignity of a revolution. This is not a revolution. This is a bunch of petty thieves who are stealing. These are petty little people who are acting out in anger just because of their envy. It's because they hate, you know, for example, uh, right now, they, uh, the, the Islamists hate anything not Islam. <laughs> well, this BLM thing, they hate anything not black or brown or whatever. That's funny how we're all really just shades of brown, aren't we? I'll prove to you right now that I'm not white. I learned this at the ark. <laughs> We're all shades of brown. Some darker shades than others, but we're all shades of brown. We should change that song, red and yellow, black and white. We're all precious in his sight. To, read, to go something like, uh, how, how did that go? No, that's the way it goes now. I don't like that one. <laughs> There's another version that says something like all shades of brown, dark to light, they're all precious in his sight. That's actually more accurate, isn't it? I've never really saw a red man, have you? Have you ever seen a red man? No. Huh. And you've really never seen a white man either, unless he's albino. I guess, you, yeah, I guess you can have an albino thrown in there, but that's, that's, that's it. So they hate the white man who elevated black communities by advancing policies that increased employment to levels never, ever seen before in the history of America. 
If you're going to pick a white man to hate, I don't think I'd pick him. That's interesting, isn't it? These people set about to honor the death of a black man that was killed, and they do it by killing black Americans. Does that make any sense to anybody? Does it not betray the fact that it has nothing to do with this? It has to do with something else. They set about to avenge the unjust killing of a black man by unjustly killing a white preacher. Does it make sense to make an appeal for justice by committing an egregious act of injustice? These people are presenting themselves as being what they hate. Aren't they? They're actually doing the stuff that they are accusing people, that they are using as the excuse for doing the stuff. It's, there's something really weird about this. There's something very, very backwards about all of this. Do you follow that line of thought? Here they are behaving and doing the very things that they were using as the excuse for doing them. Still working on that. I'll have to work on it a little longer, I think. How many of you got it so I can quit trying? Okay, good. <clears throat> Never mind that the black man unjustly killed was a criminal, which doesn't justify unjustly killing him. I get that. But this preacher guy that they killed, he hadn't done anything. It's weird, isn't it? His, in other words, the black guy that got killed unjustly, I think, although there's some things developing in that story that's going to be probably triggered a week before the election. Did you know that those guys are about that far from being let go? Yeah. Chauvin, the guy that had his knee on the neck, and the, and the two that were watching, or was it three? The three that were watching this go on? I'm serious. I'm telling you, they're about that far from having the charges dropped and they're, go and they're going to walk. Very interesting. And what do you bet they're going to try to plan that or, or trigger that one about a week or so just before the election have an absolute explosion happen? But never mind for the moment that this particular black guy was, that was unjustly killed. I keep saying that because I want to make sure I'm heard saying that. But he was a criminal. He was resisting arrest. We know that now. We saw the rest of the film. And isn't that interesting? We only got to see this much of the video. And only until after everything got triggered and all this went crazy like wildfire, wildfire, excuse me, across the country. Now, then, then they show the rest of the video. Not that it would have justified. I mean, obviously, something has to be done about that kind of, that kind of uh, behavior. I, think, I, don't think it's, I don't see any justification for what that officer did there, except that it was within the rules. Uh-oh. This guy was behaving in all the ways that point to this concern, and that's what you do in that case, according to their rules. I don't think it's a good way to do it. I think there was another way you could have handled that. I think, et cetera, we could change the rules. What's what needs to be dealt with? We need to change those policies, and that needs to be that needs to be established. But I'm telling you, this thing is really, it's just really a mess. So they set about than to avenge the unjust killing of a black man by unjustly killing a white preacher, never minding the fact for a moment that this particular black guy who was unjustly killed, did I say that already? Good. <laughs> so I did make that clear that he was unjustly killed, I think. But maybe it, according to the law, maybe not. But according to what I saw, I think so, without regard to the law. You can't judge somebody or sentence somebody based on, this is a complicated situation. 
But I'm trying to make this point. Think I'll ever get it made? Let's try again. Never mind the fact that the black man unjustly killed was a criminal violating the law and stoned out of his mind. And never mind the matter, that the matter, excuse me, provoked the concern of every American who saw that video. We were all concerned about that. Every shade of brown from darkest to lightest among us was concerned about that and would have taken action to address it. I haven't met anybody who saw that video and said, that's what they deserve. I, th I don't know anybody like that. Do you? I don't think I've ever even met anybody like that in my life. No. We would want justice in that case. We would want to correct that situation. We would have wanted that policy to be looked at or whatever had to be done to fix that. But before anybody could even have time to react or to get things going, boom. And why? Because nothing says that you really care about a dead, a person that was killed that way. Nothing says it better than burning down your own community. And you understand where I'm going with this, as I'm trying to point out that what they've put in front of us is not what we should be looking at. What they put in front of us as the reason they're doing this, that's a diversion. It's too obvious. They can't be this stupid. There's something else that's driving this. Not any concern about George Floyd. Nothing says you're righteous like flying airplanes into buildings, killing thousands of people who never did anything to you in the name of some God you call Allah. What did we learn from 9-11? And how should we act on what we learn? Let's get started on that. First, what we learn, people who hate you for ideological reasons don't care about justice, no matter how much they talk about it. And this is because justice for them is defined within their ideology. BLM ideology understands justice is killing white people for what a few Democrats did a long time ago. <clears throat> Someone mentioned, uh, I think last week or the week before, that I really should be a little more clear about what I think. And I'm working on that. But I, I'm careful about how I phrase myself in things like this. I said it the way I said it on purpose. So let's say it again and listen. People who hate you for ideological reasons, they don't care about justice. Justice is, is not something you can appeal to. You cannot appeal to them on the basis of justice. Because their understanding of that word is contained within their ideology. BLM ideology understands that it's just to kill white people because of what some Democrat white people did. Now, why'd you throw Democrat in there? Well, because that's what they were. There weren't any white Republicans doing this stuff. Name one. I'm willing to... I've, I said earlier, there are devil Republicans. Do I need to say it again? There are devils in the Republican Party. There are devils in the Independent Party. There are devils anywhere you want to look. There might even be a few in here. I'm not going to look at you right now because if I do, you'll think I'm thinking of you. There are devils everywhere you go. We understand that. So I'm not saying. I, I'm, just, I, I'm, making, I'm offering an observation that's just really interesting to me. The people that are the ones that they're talking about that did all this bad stuff are the people that they're burning buildings for now. What? 
You understand that? The, the leadership behind these groups are Democrats. Agitating this behavior. So these people are out there doing this, saying, the reason we're doing this is because white people enslaved us. While the ideology of the white people that enslaved them is standing behind them, just a, almost whiter than this paper, who are egging them on to do this. Something else is going on. You've heard me say it often. If you're looking at something that just doesn't make sense, step back and look at it and say, what sense does this make? In other words, don't let them try to define for you what you're seeing. Step back and open your eyes and look and actually see what's going on. Antifa ideology understands justice as killing Americans because America is, Americans are in the way of progress toward a Marxist utopia. You see what I mean by justice is a concept that gets locked up within their ideology. The ideology is the problem here. Islamic fascism understands justice as realizing the promise of Islam, which is ruling the world in the name of Allah. So whatever is done that advances that is just. Justified by their ideology. You begin to understand the point I'm getting at? So you can't reason with them from the point of view of justice. Justice doesn't mean to them what it means to you. There's no sense of justice where we have common ground. So if we try to appeal to them on the basis of justice in an odd and weird kind of way, it actually only fuels them to do more of their evil. In other words, they don't think of justice in the context of human rights. The word human inclusive of all beings that are sentient who possess the gift of the image of God. They don't think in terms of human rights. They think in terms of ideological rights. You can't reason with them from the point of view of things that would be understood as applying to all people. That's why they get so riled up when you say all lives matter. Because the truth is, they don't believe that. It's because you get people to start thinking about everybody in common, we got a problem. We have to keep thinking of people as segmented. We have to keep thinking of people as this group and this group and this group and this group. We can't start thinking of people as human beings. We have to think, we have to think of them as red and yellow, black or white. People who hate you for ideological reasons depersonalize everyone. Even their own groups and themselves. They become depersonalized. And that is very, very dangerous. Islamist radicals, for example, will wrap their children in bombs and send them into restaurants to explode in order to kill Jews or Americans. Now, anyone with any kind of natural affection left or remaining, any kind of humanity, would immediately look at that and say, what is wrong with you? Whatever your ideology is, whatever your beliefs are, what happened that you lost connection with humanity? That you wrap a child in a vest of explosives and send that child from your own womb into a building 
to have that baby explode or that child explode and kill everybody. You, can't. you see how it depersonalizes. You have to subordinate your value of persons to your value of the ideology. Now, there's a very interesting switch that happens toward the end of this message, but I can see him coming up on my time, but I better throw the switch now so you don't go home without this because you need to have this. There's something about Christianity that is a powerful, of course, ideology. But for some reason, it's an ideology that personalizes everybody. None of the other ideologies do that. I, Christianity enhances regard for life. Christianity accents a respect for the equal rights of all men created in the image of God. Christianity is completely different. It's not an ideology. It's something else. But for that juicy little bit, you got to come back tonight at five. <laughs> they send people on suicide missions in service to an ideology. That's very different from an individual whose own personal values inspire them to throw themselves on a hand grenade to protect his friends. That's different than an ideology that comes to you and says, we want you to go kill yourself on behalf of our cause. You see the difference? It's hugely different. It's very different from an individual willingly sacrificing themselves personally in order to protect others. But you know, Christians are never called upon to willingly sacrifice themselves to advance Christianity. Oh, we're called to sacrifice on a personal level, but it's all free will and all that kind of stuff. But at no point, I mean, if God did come along and tell you to offer your son a living sacrifice, I mean, a, uh, a burnt offering, uh, don't worry, he'll meet you on the hill just before you plunge the knife and say, uh-uh. Some of you know enough Bible to follow that little quip that was supposed to be at least amusing. Turned out to be kind of nothing, <laughs> apparently. But anyway, you know what I mean. God told Abraham, take your son, your only son, offer him as a burnt offering. And yet before Abraham could do that, God showed up and said, no, we're not going to do that. I'm going to be the offering. Or in other words, the point of that story is God doesn't do that. You hear that? That's the, the point of that story is this is not what God, God does not expect us to do that. He laid his own life down for us. BLM Antifa attacked their own. Isn't that strange? I mean, they actually do. They attack their own communities and their own people. They've killed more black people than they have white people during this whole ordeal. Have you noticed that? What in the world is going on? How does that make any sense to anybody? They're actually doing, as I pointed out earlier, what it is they're protesting against. And they're doing it as a way of protesting it. Who scrambled their brains? How does that make any sense? They kill their own. They destroy their own communities. They're destroying their own, the livelihoods of their, of their own people. And they want to categorize themselves as my people and your people. This is the way they want to live. But okay, well, th then you're mad at this people, so you're attacking this people, your own people. Where does this make sense? It makes sense at a, at a level that you have to get to to really understand what's going on. And I will be developing that tonight, where this does make sense. But right now, let's just look at this and, and agree together. This doesn't make any sense. They can't be telling us 
the reason that we're doing this is because you kill black people and to show you why that we're mad about you killing black people we're gonna well we're gonna kill black people what not that I'm inviting them to come kill white people I'm going to get into why it is there has not been a focused assault on white communities. And I'll do that tonight. And I'm not just only trying to bait you. It's just I really don't have the time to develop it right now. I'll have to develop it tonight. But I am going to get into that. Because that's obviously the question you've got to be asking yourself right now. Why aren't they attacking the white communities? Well, there are some very practical reasons they don't do that. And when you look at the practical reasons they don't do that, you realize this has nothing to do with what they're telling us it's about. It's about something else. The depersonalization that's necessary, it goes to extremes. Shackleford, for example, she teaches all white people are demons. She says, she's talking to a group of white people, by the way, Mostly, mostly white people. And she says, well, shades of, shades of brown, you know what I mean? Lighter, lighter shades of brown people. <laughs> and she says to them, you are born into being non-human. Depersonalization. I remember the new Black Panther movement that, came, that, that got some notoriety a little while back. You remember some of those things? This was a few years ago. Uh, and it, it got out that in some of these meetings that these new Black Panthers were having, they were having speeches where the speaker was saying stuff like, I hate all white people. I want to see all white people dead. When I see a white baby, I want to grab that baby and smash its head on the ground. I want all white crackers dead. Do you remember seeing the, any of those? Only a few of you saw some of that. Yeah, pretty outrageous stuff. See, you have to depersonalize groups of people in order to say stuff like that. But as they say these things, they are depersonalizing themselves, aren't they? I mean, they're dehumanizing themselves. They have to adopt in their ideology, they have to leave humanity. They have to leave being aware that we are all one people under God. You have to start thinking of people only in these segmented groups, each with its own ideology in conflict with the other. They turn people into objects of hatred. And they do this indiscriminately, by the way. That is, they condemn people as a class rather than taking each person as an individual, as an individual human being. People who hate you for ideological differences have no way to address you with reason. And it leaves only violence. It's all that's left. One of the reasons that these people who are ideologically driven do not like to engage you in conversation is because any conversation that begins to work in any kind of level of reasoning threatens them. So they don't want their people talking to your people. I mean, they'll go so far as, in fact, um, Michael brought this out during our meeting, how the escorts, if they, they don't, they don't, they're not supposed to talk to you guys. They don't want you talking to them. And if you start talking to one of these mothers coming into the, to the abortuary, they will sometimes physically get between you and take this person and walk them away. They don't want to have a conversation. I've seen this over and over and over again. In the case of Islam, it's the same way. You force everyone to, to bow to Islam. That's it. That's what we're here to do. We're here to force everyone to bow to Islam. Period. That's it. In the case of BLM Antifa, we're here to force everyone to bow to our demands. That's it. 
There's nothing to talk about here. Pay reparations. In the case of BLM Antifa, to force everyone to bow to their demands requires them to scream and yell and holler their anger. And then just get louder if you try to reason with them. Just get louder. Yell louder. They will not enter into a discussion with you. I've seen, I watched a video just recently of a group that was, uh, I forget what they were, I think they were pro-Trump or something like that, but anyway, they were, they were doing a little march on a bridge, and some Antifa came out to oppose them. And so the Antifa uh, got in front of them and would stop, blocking their way, and so the, the little group, that all they were doing was going to march across, waving their American flags and holding up Trump signs. So they're walking along. How many of you saw that by any chance? I described enough of it for anybody to recognize it. He didn't. I guess maybe I spent a little too much time looking at this stuff. But anyway, so this group is walking along on this bridge, and this end of a little, a little oh, uh, 10 maybe, I got there, there probably about 100 of the, of, the, of the other people. And so, and they kept doing everything they could to get the people on the Trump side to attack them. They get in their face and yell at them and impede their progress. Now, it's interesting, isn't it? The people who, had a, who have a right to walk on a public sidewalk, that right's being denied to them by a group. That's interesting. But it's okay for them to do that. So anyway, this, this little drama goes on and on, but what I was really going to bring out was this. One of the guys kept saying things to him. Yeah, it was really, the guy, he did a good job. You know, he'd be good on your, one of your uh, things at the, at the, uh, the mortuary because he was very calm and he just kept saying good things. We love you. Jesus loves you. If you want to have a conversation, we can do that. How about this? He'd throw something out there. And they did the same thing over and over and over again. If they got real aggressive, he'd go, Jesus loves you and I love you. But have you thought about this? Boom. It was, it was actually well, well done. I'm not sure I had the personality for it, but it was really, really good. <laughs> I admired it. So, this guy, one guy, started listening. One of them made the fatal error of trying to answer back with a reasonable argument. There we go. And this guy caught it. I could tell him by his face. He was, he was, oh. And they went back and forth with him in a calm way. And that guy, his defenses began to break down. So what one of these really, really hyper-radical Antifa guys did is jumped into the face of the guy that was talking and just started like this and then with his hand pushing the guy away. See, they know that if you start having a conversation that, that goes along the lines of we are all human beings, I'm human, you're human. I have rights, you have rights. I respect your rights. When you start having a conversation like that, the radicals get in your face and go out of their mind and start yelling and screaming insults and getting in the way and all this viciously because it's not about reason. It's not about justice. It's not even about being human. It's like this college student I watched in a conversation with some white girl that does this sort of stuff on college campuses. I don't know her name. But she was engaging this young lady college student in a conversation and that student made the mistake of actually trying to reason. I say the mistake, I'm being facetious, of course. It's actually a really good thing. This is what should happen. But that young lady began to say, went ahead and got into the conversation. And then she made this statement. She said, you are racist, she said to this white girl. Well, this lighter shade of brown girl. And the lighter shade of brown said, I'll call her, never mind, I was going to say, 
LSB, but that sounds too close to other things, so we'll just leave it alone. Lighter shade of bra. Uh, this lighter girl said, <laughs> why do you call me racist? What's your basis for that? And she said it in a really friendly way. And the person responded, the college kids responded by saying, and by the way, a kid to me is anything under 30. All right, I'm sorry. I apologize to those of you who are 30. You're, you're a real man and you're a real woman. Believe me that I hold you in esteem as actual adults. I really do. But just at my age, my perspective is kind of weird. So this young lady, she says, you are going to vote for Trump, right? To which the lighter shade said, yes. Well, what more do I need to say? You're racist. Oh, I'm racist because I'm going to vote for Trump. Yes. Well, what's your basis for that? Explain to me how you make that connection. And this girl comes back and says, I don't need to do that. You're voting for Trump. That means you're racist. So this lady did a smart thing. She said, well, who, who, you're voting for Biden, right? And the college kid says, yes. And so lighter shade said, you're a pedophile. <laughs> Whoa. And so college student says, no, I'm not. Lighter shade says, yes, you are. College student says, no, I'm not. Lighter shade says, yes, you are. Well, why do you say that? You're voting for Biden, aren't you? If you're voting for Biden, you're a pedophile. I didn't get to see where the conversation went from there. I had to, I, I think they cut it off right then or something like that. I would have loved to see where it went. Unfortunately, a lot of times those sorts of things go to a bad place. It reminds me when I was a kid watching a peace protest and these uh, people holding signs says, give peace a chance. And <laughs> some of you remember the story. And this guy walked by just talking to them and saying, you know, well, you know, sometimes we have to go to war. And she hit him with her sign. <laughs> Boom! <laughs> give peace a chance. That's what we're seeing today. Because there's no reasoning with people who have given up the whole concept that we are all human beings who don't reason from the base of the natural understanding that we all share humanity in common. You can't reason with people like that. Consequently, you cannot appeal to their common sense of justice or humanity. And so therefore, you have no basis for reasoning. Do you catch this? There's no foundation to have any kind of reasoned argument or discussion with these people. When ideology destroys an appeal that's based on justice and simple humanity, then you have no foundation for reason. And all that's left is what? War. That's all that's left. And I'm not saying this. Well, what we need to do is just decide we're at war. Grab your guns. That's not what I'm saying. I am saying you better get your guns. You better have them. And you better learn how to use them. Because these people can't be reasoned with. I'm saying that. We cannot allow them to become stronger than we are. You can't allow that. You cannot allow them to have more resources than you have. You cannot allow them to have greater resolve to take your liberties than you have to keep them. You cannot allow them to have greater resilience in their pursuit of what they're trying to do than you have resilience and protecting your inalienable rights. We must have the power to protect our persons and our property. And we must be willing to use that power. Now, some of you who've been kind of following along with my thinking on these sorts of things for many, many, many years, you, you might remember 10, I'm, I'm doing a, I've been saying this for 20 years thing today, it seems like. 
But I, I don't know how long ago it was when we first started our radio broadcast, but I have been saying this certainly since 9-11. If things don't change, if we can't get revival in America, the polarization is continuing to a snapping place. When it snaps, there'll be war. I've been saying that since like 2001. I'm concerned about the growing divide between the left and the right. I'm concerned about the polarization developing in our culture. And the only thing that's going to answer this, the only thing that will do it is a revival of the Christian religion, the gospel. Now, I'm going to pick it up right there tonight, and I'm going to develop this. And actually, you're in, you might think, well, that's pretty simple. I got it. Don't need to be here tonight. No, you don't, <laughs> because there are some really interesting insights about this that I think you're going to find very, very helpful so hopefully all of you who are able will come on back and you do anyway. So praise the Lord for that. But uh, tonight we're going to finish this up. Right now let's conclude the message. Stand with me please. Let's conclude by saying hopefully you get what I'm, what I'm getting at here. It's an ideological conflict. And what's happened is our country has been segmented ideologically. We no longer have a shared view of justice. We don't even have a shared view of humanity. And because we don't, we, we have a, a polarization split in our view of things like justice and even humanity, we're losing our ability to maintain any kind of cohesive community that's based on reason. We're losing it. Now, this doesn't mean we give up on appealing to them from the point of view of reason. It doesn't mean that at all. In fact, I go into that tonight, and I'm, you know, but I'm going to need to stop now. But I will go into that tonight, and I think you'll find it really, really fascinating, very interesting, very helpful. I remember 9-11. I remember more keenly this year than I have any year since. I remember it so keenly this year because it's happening this year. We are under attack by an ideological enemy that you cannot reason with. I'm going to share tonight how to act on that. What do we do moving forward? We don't give up on, on the hope for revival. I really, really do hate sending you home with this and not the rest of it. But I'm going to anyway. Because I just, I just need to stop here. But I really hope you, if you can't come, then by all means tune in to our live stream and, and get it that way. But please don't not get the next message because you need it to really round this one out. How many of you agree with me? You just saw, How many of you are feeling a little bit like you did last, 2001? Anybody else? Am I the only one? No, many of you. That's what I thought. Yeah, just kind of deja vu, feeling that same fear, that same concern. God help us. So that's what I want you to do. I want you to pray. Pray this. God help us. Well, that's the invitation. Let's respond to God. Tenderly, Jesus is calling calling for you and for me in the portals waiting and watching watching for you and for me come home come home Ye who are weary, come home. Earnestly, tenderly, Jesus is calling, calling, oh sinner, come home. If you died right now, where would you be? Boy, I'd love to hear that. How many of you would like to just go ahead and go? 
Well, I'm with you there too. But we're here because there's work for us to do. So we can't come in yet. Right? One time dad put us on a project pulling weeds in the backyard. I got tired of pulling weeds. I wanted to get in the house. And I started to come into the house. He came out and he stopped me. He says, he looked around and said, we're not done yet. A little while later, I feel like, you know, sun was going down a little bit. Time to come in. Dad came out and said, there's still light out here, son. You can still see weeds. As long as you can see weeds, you're pulling them. So I stayed out there. You know what Father's saying to you who want to go home right now? You still got some weeds to deal with. If you don't know where you're going to go when you die, please come see me before you go home tonight or today. I'm thinking about tonight's message. That's where I'm at for some reason. But uh, if if you have trouble in your heart, any question, any concern, please see me before you go home. Let's sing one more verse as we conclude. If you want to get help with that and you want to step forward, we'll help you right now. Otherwise, you see me before you leave today. While we sing and we conclude. Terry, when Jesus is waiting, pleading for you, and for me why should we linger and heed not his mercies mercies for you and for me come home come home ye who are weary come home Earnestly, tenderly, Jesus is calling, calling, O oh sinner, come home. Brother Peter, come dismiss us in prayer. Praise the Lord.